church. Uh, there's a few announcements in your handouts that I sent out, and there's one that's not in there. I sent out an email about um, picking up the road ditch, and it looks like maybe Wednesday evening will be um, good enough weather for that. I don't know. We're going to kind of play it by ear because I'm not going to do it in the rain and wouldn't expect you to do it in the rain. Uh, so I will send out a, a, a finalizing email when that uh, comes about when we figure that out. Our psalm today is Psalm 18, the rest of it, uh, verses 25 through 50. Psalm 18, verses 25 through 50. With the kind, you show yourself kind. With the blameless, you show yourself blameless. With the pure, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you show yourself astute. For you save an afflicted people, but haughty eyes you abase. For you, are, for you light my lamp, the Lord my God illumines my darkness. For by you I can run upon a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is blameless. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The God who girds me with strength and makes my way blameless. He makes my feet like hinds feet and sets me upon my high places. He trains my hands for battle, so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have also given me the shield of your salvation, 
and your right hand upholds me, and your gentleness makes me great. You enlarge my steps under me, and my feet have not slipped. I pursued my enemies and overtook them, and I did not turn back until they were consumed. I shattered them so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet. You have girded me with strength for battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. You have also made my enemies turn their backs to me, and I destroyed those who hated me. They cried for help, but there was none to save, even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. Then I beat them fine as the dust before the wind. I emptied them out as the mire of the streets. You have delivered me from the contentions of the people. You have placed me as head of the nations, a people whom I have not known serve me. As soon as they hear, they obey me. Foreigners submit to me. Foreigners fade away and come trembling out of their fortress. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation, the God who executes vengeance for me and subdues people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. Surely you lift me above those who rise up against me. You rescue me from the violent man. Therefore I will give thanks to you among the nations, O Lord, and I will sing praise to your name. He gives great deliverance to his king and shows loving kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you are our rock and our salvation, that we can come to you and depend on you, and you sovereignly care for us and watch over us and provide for us. You save us and you, you keep us saved. Father, we pray for those who we know, our friends and our family who are far from you, that that you would draw them to yourself, God, that you would open their eyes and their ears to hear the gospel. We pray that you would give us courage to share the gospel with those who are far from, from you, Lord, those who we know, that we might be courageous in carrying out the Great Commission. Lord, as we continue now to worship you this morning with song and prayer and reading and preaching of the Scripture, we pray that you're glorified in that and that we make much of you, God. We make much of you and lift you up. We give you the glory in all things, praise you in all things, in Jesus' name, amen. Even in your homes, let's stand and worship our great God. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name When the sun's shining down on me When the world's all as it should be Blessed be your name Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering Though there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. 
you give and take away you give and take away my heart will choose to stay but blessed be your name blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your name jesus blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your glorious name blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your name jesus blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your glorious name
Let's adore Him. Behold our King. Nothing can compare. Come, let us Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here in this place today. Those few of us who are gathering here, we thank you for the technology that uh, we can continue to study and learn from your word, even when we're apart. Uh, Lord, we praise you and we give you the thanks and, and the glory in all things, Lord, and lift you up and pray that your will will be done in our lives, in the life of this church corporately, as well as in our lives individually. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome again to our virtual church service. I'm thankful that the Lord has brought you to our website today to tune in and hear, what, hear from His Word. This Lord's Day we will be continuing our study of the Acts of the Apostles, and today we will be considering verses 33 through 42 of chapter 5. Verses 33 through 42 of chapter 5. Of Acts, So I invite you to take your Bibles in hand or whatever device you happen to use to use Scripture, to read Scripture, and turn with me over to the fifth chapter of Acts. Two weeks ago, in this narrative, we saw God purifying His church. Ananias and Sapphira had been struck dead for lying to the Holy Spirit, which led to genuine church growth, if you can believe that. But that growth was of sold-out believers. 
Last week we found the Jewish leadership jealous over the growing popularity of the apostles in the new church. That jealousy resulted in the apostles being thrown in jail, which then led to an angel of the Lord breaking them out of jail, and then, of course, them returning to preach the gospel to the people. The Jewish leadership peacefully gathered them up again, not wanting to upset the people and get stoned to death in the process. And then they brought them before the council, which ordered them not to preach in the name of Jesus. To which, if you recall, Peter once again said that we are to obey God rather than men. And then he preached the gospel to the Jewish leadership that he was standing in front of. God purified his church, which led to it growing exponentially, which led to persecution, which always leads to a more pure and healthy church. As a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church, we need to expect persecution. And when it comes, we need to stand strong in the faith, rooted in the Word of God. If and when it comes, it will only make us stronger. It will make us healthier and more pure. In order to be ready, one must first belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. That means that if you are to survive any persecution at all, you must be born again. You need to repent of your sins and trust in Christ to save you from the wrath to come. And I call on you to do that right now. Right where you sit in your homes, repent and trust in Christ today so that you might live. In our text before us this Lord's Day, we are still in the same scene as we were last week. The, the narrative continues. Uh, Peter has just finished accusing the Jewish leadership of killing Jesus and then preaching the gospel to them. So keep that in mind. And as we will see in our text, the apostles get a mixed reaction to Peter's preaching, which results in punishment, praising, and of course, more preaching. Let's go now to our text. I invite you to stand with me, even in your homes, in reverence for the reading of the word of the living God. Acts chapter 5, verses 33 and continuing through 42. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of census and, and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if, it, for if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. This is the inerrant, immutable word of the living God. Father, again this morning we come to you and ask that you open our hearts and minds Lord, that you give us understanding and wisdom and discernment to see what you have for us in this text. Oh God, if there are those who are listening online who don't know you, I pray that you would open their hearts and minds today to the gospel, that they would hear the gospel, that you would draw them to yourself, that they would respond to the gospel in repentance and faith. God, we plead for the souls of those who are lost. And Father, we, I pray that you would help me to uh, rightly divide your word this morning, that it might be clearly understood and that that understanding would get from the head to the heart and affect the way that we live in service to you. We give you the glory in all things and pray that your will be done, as always, in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. When someone is confronted with the gospel, that person will typically respond in one of three ways. He or she will respond in anger, in indifference, or an acceptance. Let's consider those responses for a moment. 
It's not at all hard to understand why someone would respond to the gospel in anger. If it's being presented correctly, then one is made painfully aware of his utter lack of goodness and his complete inability to come to Christ on his own. No one, no one wants to hear that he or she is not good. No one wants to hear that that he's completely unable to do something on his own. I know I don't like that at all. After all, most of us have been raised to believe that we are basically good. Parents are constantly telling their children that they are the greatest thing since sliced bread and how wonderful and perfect they are. And then some mean evangelist comes along and shatters his world by telling him that in fact he's a wretch headed for hell and there's nothing good in him. And furthermore, he is incapable of doing anything good. There is no doubt that that is offensive and can result in anger and or hostility. It's offensive. Others respond with really no response at all. They, they remain uh, merely indifferent to the gospel. They either give it little or to no thought or they simply dismiss it as something that they might come back to at another time when life's just right. After all, you know, life is busy and, and, and they have a pretty good life and are not really interested in introducing something to it like the gospel that might upset the apple cart. Their thought is perhaps that, that there will always be a time to get right with God. For years, I, I personally fell into this camp. I believed the Bible to be 100% true. I believed that there was a God. I believed that I need saving from that God. But I was indifferent to the gospel because I thought there would always be time to get right with Him. I had visions of living my life as an absolute pagan, relishing in my sin right up until I was about to draw my last breath and then suddenly I would cry out to God. And he would save me. That is a foolish notion. That's a foolish notion. You, you simply do not know when you will draw your final breath. And there may not be time to cry out to God in repentance and faith. And there are no second chances. There is no such thing as purgatory and neither can someone pray you out of hell and into heaven. It's final. And finally, there are those who respond rightly to the gospel when they hear it. They cry out to God in repentance and faith. They surrender their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. They love the Lord and seek to serve Him all of their days. Three distinctly different reactions to the same gospel. And only one results in salvation. In our text before us this Lord's Day, we get a glimpse of all three of those reactions. Let's go back now and dig in a bit. Take a look at verse 33. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. Now remember, this is the Sanhedrin that, that Peter has just got through accusing of killing Jesus. Here we have an example of this first reaction of anger, hatred, in fact. When Peter finished with his gospel presentation, which, as I said a moment ago, accused the Jewish leadership of active rebellion against the God they supposedly represented, as well as murdering the Messiah, their Messiah, with their own hands, they were enraged. They were so enraged, in fact, that they wanted to kill the apostles. Just as had been the case with Jesus, the Jewish leadership was completely blind to the authenticity of the signs and wonders that the apostles were doing. They could not deny that the miracles were real. You never see them do that. Yet rather than seek the true source of those miracles, they want to, again, murder the ones performing them. The NASB says the Jewish, Jewish leaders were cut to the quick. And that is a, a literal translation of the Greek word. And it, and it brings to mind a passage in Hebrews that says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of of the heart. Doesn't that give you a, a, a picture of what is going on there in that council as Peter speaks the word of God to them? He's speaking the word of God to the enemies of God and it's, it's cutting them like a double-edged sword. And that results in absolute rage and hatred. 
Now verse 34. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. Well, there happened to be a very famous Pharisee present that day at the meeting of the Sanhedrin. His name is Gamaliel. Gamaliel was, as the text says, held in high honor among the people. The Pharisees in general were held in high honor, more high, a higher honor, let's say, than the Sadducees because the Pharisees came from the common folks, whereas the Sadducees were wealthy blue bloods of the elite ruling class. However, Gamaliel was held in high esteem even among the other Pharisees. He had much influence over the Sanhedrin and the people. So the Sadducees were inclined to listen to him. They give ear to him, as we will see. Now, Gamaliel was also the personal teacher of an up-and-coming pharisaical rising star known as Saul of Tarsus. You recognize that name? We're going to get to him in our study of Acts. You surely know he would later be known as the Apostle Paul. Gamaliel was Paul's personal tutor. Okay? In fact, it is possible that Paul was present when all of this was taking place. That's speculation, but it is possible. Because at this time in Paul's life, he was a sold-out Pharisee with utter disdain and hatred for the new movement of Jesus' followers. It was happened to be called the Way at that time. At any rate, Gamaliel stands up and he asks that the apostles be removed from the room for a moment while he speaks. Now verse 35. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. It looks like from this verse that Gamaliel was on the side of the apostles, doesn't it? He's advising the Sanhedrin to proceed with caution concerning the apostles. And then he provides some examples to bolster his argument. Take a look at verses 36 and 37. These are his examples. For before these days, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So Gamaliel proceeds to roll out or relate this historical evidence of other uprisings that were eventually eliminated without the interference of the Sanhedrin. Well, there's a couple of things here. First, if you were to do some scholarly research, if you were to read some, some commentaries on this passage, you would find the critics screaming error in Luke's account here. And I always like to address that when it comes up, because I want you to know there's no error in Scripture. And here's where they get that. The historian Josephus also records in his writings a Theodos and a Judas from Galilee. And those two people who rebelled against the Romans and had followings, but the time frames don't match. That is, Luke's time frame and Josephus' time frame are different recording these events. Now, that should not be hard at all, at all for us to resolve because we know that the Word of God is without error. The Word of Josephus is not. In fact, it is well known, like many historians, much of Josephus' stuff is filled with error or biased or slanted to one degree or another. We need to trust the Word of God over any and all man-made writings, always. And secondly, how is it that the apostles could be categorized with men who led rebellions? They were not terrorists. In fact, they were not violent at all, willingly submitting to the governing authorities, knowing that God sovereignly places all authority in power. If you were to look at their history, the most violent thing that had happened was when Peter lopped off the ear of the temple guard when they come to arrest our Lord in the garden. And what happened is our Lord healed the guard's ear immediately and rebuked, rebuked Peter for doing it. The apostles were known for healing people, not killing people. There's both complete hatred as well as extensive ignorance on the part of the Sanhedrin here. Gamaliel gives two examples and then continues with his statement. Take a look at verse 38 and the first two-thirds of verse 39. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, 
you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. Well, there's no doubt that when we first read this, we first take it in, it looks as if Gamaliel is almost supporting the apostles with this, this statement, doesn't it? But is he? We'll see in a moment. But we do see here some of Gamaliel's theology. Unlike the Sadducees, Gamaliel believes that God is sovereignly in control of all things. That I can agree with. But what about his statement, if it is of man, it will fail, but if it is of God, it will succeed? What about that statement? It might be said that Gamaliel is a patron saint of the wait and see or do nothing movements. Let's think about Gamaliel's statement in two parts. Consider the first part. If this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. Does that sound right to you? What about Islam? Islam is definitely not of God, yet it continues to spread like a diseased virus around the world. Jehovah's Witness, absolutely not of God. Yet there's kingdom halls all over the place. Mormonism, surely not of God. Yet it also continues along with many other cults and false religions. Liberalism infiltrating and destroying many denominations is a direct result of the wait-and-see, do-nothing attitude. This notion that whatever is not of God will fail is absolutely false. There is no doubt that many evil movements and organizations succeed today and have in the past. Now, we know that they only do so under the sovereign rule of God. And we also know that they will not stand in the end. However, Gamaliel is not speaking of the eternal, but rather the temporal. Now, consider the second part of Gamaliel's statement. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. That is absolutely true, isn't it? That's absolutely true. Think of all that has been done to try and stomp out the true biblical Christianity, yet here we are. Even when we can't gather together in the building, we are still here. Jesus says that it is He who builds His church. It is Christ's church, and it is Christ who does the building, not you and I. That means that the true church, that group of people who are made up of truly born-again believers, that, that true church, growth of that is supernatural. Which means that the true church will never be defeated. It will never be stomped out because it is all of God and protected by God. And to redirect the words of Gamaliel a bit, when you oppose the true church, you oppose God. But is Gamaliel really for the apostles? Is he responding rightly to the gospel that he just heard? Let's go on and see. Take a look at the rest of 39 and verse 40. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So the Sanhedrin takes the advice of this famous Gamaliel, sort of, sort of. They call the apostles back in, once again command them not to preach the gospel, and then the text says that they had them beat. The NASB says the apostles were flogged. In other words, they, were, they very likely received the same type of flogging as our Lord did before His crucifixion. They were very, quite likely, strapped to a whipping post with their feet barely touching the ground so as to stretch the skin on their backs tight, and then given 40 lashes minus 1, so 39, as the law required, by a cat of nine tails. A cat of nine tails was a device designed to inflict maximum damage, sometimes tearing through the skin down to bone and exposing organs. Now, we don't know that that was the case with the apostles. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that this wasn't just a slap on the wrist. It wasn't just a warning not to do it again. The apostles were severely beaten for the cause of Christ. So, was Gamaliel truly on the side of the apostles? No, 
He was not. He was indifferent. He was indifferent. He didn't, act, he didn't react in anger and hatred as the Sadducees did. But he was at best indifferent, doing absolutely nothing, doing nothing to prevent the apostles from receiving a beating. He, he perhaps saved them from execution, but he did not keep them from receiving a beating. He neither confirms nor denied the gospel. Unfortunately for him, there is no fence writing. Unfortunately for all of us, there is no fence writing. You are either with Jesus or you you are against him. Jesus himself says as much in Matthew 12, 30, where he says, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. There is no fence writing. Are you with the Savior or are you against him? There is no middle ground. There's no middle ground. Now verse 41. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Wow. Wow, what a reaction. This should cause us to pause. If you are claiming to be a sold-out follower of Christ, this should cause you to pause and think for a moment. I know it sure caused me to stop and think for a moment. In the middle of my study, I stopped. I've read this many times. And I had to stop. I had to ask myself, would I rejoice at suffering for the cause of Christ? Would I? Would you? I sure like to think that I would be able to rejoice in my suffering for Christ. Is that pride and arrogance? I'd like to think that I would celebrate the chance to show my love and devotion to Christ through suffering for Him and His cause like the apostles did. We live in a world today that is obsessed with self. We live amongst a generation that is more self-centered and more self-serving than any other generation in modern times. A generation that is so afraid to die that the mere mention of a virus, a virus that has an excellent chance of survival, sends them into a panic in which it will give up all its rights and completely rely on the government hanging on every word and command issued by the state, ruled by fear. A generation ago, young men voluntarily went and died for freedom they would never experience. Today, folks fight over toilet paper, if you can believe that. There is no honor, there is no virtue in self-aggrandizement, none. As believers, we are to honor and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, not ourselves. Not ourselves. Our rights, as defined in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, are great, but they do not compare to the privilege of serving King Jesus. Our rights should not be our focus. Our personal comfort and pleasure should not be what drives us and motivates us. What should drive us and motivate us and get us out of bed in the morning is serving the Lord. If that means we have to give up our liberty and rights, as it very well may someday, then so be it. This is not our home folks. This is not our final destination. Death is not the end, but only the beginning. Our focus needs to be carrying out the Great Commission and seeking and saving the lost, not 
protesting the erosion of our personal comforts. Please, don't misunderstand me. I love this country, and I love the rights and privileges that we enjoy here. And I will absolutely vote for those who best represent those rights and freedoms and who most closely align with a biblical worldview, and you should too. But that is not why we are here. That's not why we're here. We are not here to be political activists. We're here to be Jesus activists. We're here to be proclaimers of the gospel. And there's no doubt that sometimes that will involve persecution and suffering. My prayer is that if, if and when the time comes to suffer, even, even die for the sake of Christ, that I have the courage to do so. And to do so all the while rejoicing in the opportunity like the apostles did. May the Holy Spirit empower us all to live our lives for Christ and to die joyfully for Christ. And finally, verse 42. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus, that the Messiah is Jesus. The trial that resulted in them being punished, being scourged, flogged, led to praising and more preaching. It had the exact opposite effect that the Sanhedrin was hoping for. And I want you to note that the apostles were teaching and preaching Christ every day. Do you see that? Not just on Sundays. Every day. Their lives revolved around the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the very center of their life. He was why they lived and breathed. So what? It just has to do, have to do with us, right? In our text today, we see three reactions to the gospel. The first reaction by the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin is one of absolute hatred. They hate the apostles, and they hate the truth that, that they represent, so much so that they wanted to murder them. The second reaction is of indifference is displayed by Gamaliel. He's not necessarily against the apostles, but neither is he for them. He's a fence rider. He's lukewarm. He's indifferent. And finally, we see the reaction of sold-out devoted devotion displayed in the reaction of the apostles. Even in the face of severe persecution and punishment, they rejoice. And rather than squelch the evangelistic zeal of the apostles in the first church, it fuels it. It's like, it's like throwing gas on a fire. Persecution is. The very same gospel. Three different reactions. Three distinctly different reactions. And only one of those reactions is saving. The rest are damning. So I want to ask you this morning to take a moment and do some reflection. I want you to check your hearts and see what kind of a reaction you have, have had in the past or are having currently to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, the fact of the matter is that you are not good. And it's not, it's not that you sin occasionally, but rather it is your very nature to sin. You lie and look at others with lust and use the Lord's name in vain. We all do. And Scripture says that there is no one who does good. No, not one. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. You are not good and cannot be good enough to enter into God's kingdom. God is, God is perfectly holy and He's perfectly just and He will not let sin go unpunished. If you remain in your sin... You are ruined. The wages of sin is death. Not just a physical death, but an eternal death where you will suffer for all eternity in a very real place called hell. That is the simple truth of the fate of man in his natural sinful state. Does that truth anger you? 
Are you indif indifferent to it? Or does it concern you? See, once you understand that truth, then you're ready for the good news. And you're ready for the gospel. While you were still in that sinful state, fully knowing all of the sinful, wretched things you would do, all the wretched things you would think about, all the wretched things you would say, Christ stood in your place and died for you. He stood in your place and He took the punishment that was justly due you so that you might be put into right standing with God. The Lord Jesus Christ suffered the holy wrath of God so that you and I wouldn't have to. What's required of you is that you repent and forsake your sin and that you turn to Christ, trusting Him in Him and His work on the cross to save you from the wrath, to God, wrath of God. Trust in Christ, in Christ alone, and you will be saved. You'll be redeemed. You'll be delivered from the punishment of your sin. And then when you die or the Lord comes back, you will live with Him for all eternity. That is the truth of the gospel. That is the same gospel that the apostles were preaching and teaching every day from home to home and in the temple. That is the same gospel that Peter presented to the Sanhedrin. The question is, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to allow it to make you angry and reject it? Are you going to shrug your shoulders and remain indifferent to it, ignoring it and going about your life as usual? Or are you going to throw yourself on the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, crying out to God in repentance and faith? Only the third option saves. The other two result in damnation. I implore you to run to the cross this very day, this very moment. I beg you not to delay. Not to delay another moment. You simply do not know what the future holds. This could be your last chance. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the time. Repent and believe today and you will be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we are so thankful for your word and the example that you provide for us in your word of Peter and the apostles. And Lord, to rejoice in suffering is incredible. To take a severe beating and rejoice in the, in the fact that you were worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus, think of that. If we get a hangnail, sometimes we are weepy and whiny. God, give us the courage to worship you rightly. Give us the courage to stand for you. Give us the courage to proclaim the gospel every day in our lives by the what we say, by the way we live, that the people that we come into contact with will no doubt say, wow, there is something different about that person. And then give us the courage to open our mouths and tell them what it is. Father, help us to glorify you in all that we say and think and do. I pray for those who are gathering with us online, Lord, that uh, those who typically gather here and those who don't, those who are far away, I pray for them in this, in this strange season, God, that you would encourage them and empower them, that they would find their strength in you, not in themselves, but in you, that they would trust in you, that they would surrender to you, that they would repent of their sins. I pray that you would care for them and watch over them physically and especially spiritually. Lord, we plead for the souls of those who are lost. And God, as always, we give you the praise and the glory in all things and help us to praise and, and honor and glorify you in all that we say and think and do as we live before your face. We pray that your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling Calling for you and for me See on the portals He's waiting and watching Watching
searching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh. Should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you? are gathering, deathbeds are coming, coming for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus. Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. Oh, for the wonderful love He has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, He has mercy. Pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor upon you and give you peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Go serve your king. We'll see you next week. Come home.